hours before Mary Margaret found out it had to be a Zoom. And we Zoomed it in. <laughs> and so it's such a delight. Dr. Ben Donaldson, we're so thrilled to have you come be with us tonight. And Mary Margaret, I want to thank you again and again. She's very persistent, right? Yes. <laughs> and, yes. and thank goodness, Mary Margaret set all of this up. So I'm going to step back and ask her to please come introduce Dr. Ben Danielson. Thank you. Thank you for that, but I don't deserve it. It was Dr. Bergman. Where are you, Dr. Bergman? Oh, yeah. there, there. Who recruited Dr. Ben Danielson, and I don't know where their connection is. Maybe we'll find out. <laughs> but at any rate, I first became aware of what a tremendous contribution uh, Dr. Ben Danielson had made to the community of Seattle when I was a school nurse with Seattle Public Schools and I became acquainted with a wonderful Odessa Brown Clinic. It was a splendid facility with wraparound services for people who very much needed it and I was so impressed when I found out that uh, it was available to the children of Seattle and I'm deeply grateful for Dr. Danielson for decades of work there. But that's just one of many things. He is a, presently a clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington where he received his medical degree in 1992 after he had completed undergraduate studies at Harvard University. He completed his pediatric residency at Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Danielson was the senior medical director for the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic until late of 2020. He worked there for over 20 years, combining patient care, clinic leadership, and community advocacy. He wrote this, and I think you'll like it as I do. In early life, he was rescued from the foster care system by a single mom who instilled in him and his sisters the value of education and community service. He told me his mother is an artist and he enjoyed the pictures on our walls, which we also appreciate. <laughs> Dr. Danielson also serves on various boards of health-related organizations, philanthropic organizations, and community groups dedicated to health issues. He chairs the Governor's Interagency Council on Health Disparities, co-chaired the Governor's Task Force on Creating an Office of Equity, chairs the Group Health Foundation Board, is a board member on King County's Children and Youth Advisory Board, and has been on King County's Board of Health. Dr. Danielson was a member of the Washington State Health Benefit Exchange in the first several years from its inception. He is on a number of organizational boards, including the University of Washington Foundation, Amara Adoption and Foster Care Services, and the Center for Children and Youth Justice. He has provided many addresses in numerous venues, including the University of Washington's commitment address in 2018. The unifying thread in Dr. Danielson's activities relates to promoting well-being and dignity, especially for communities who have been pushed aside. I'd like to read that again. 
The unifying thread in Dr. Danielson's activities relates to promoting well-being and dignity, especially for communities who have been pushed aside. We are honored and elated to welcome Dr. Ben Danielson. What a very, very kind introduction. Thank you. You're allowed to take your mask off. No. 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 Not anymore? Not anymore. I'm not letting the speakers take their masks off. No. No. But I will do my best to project my voice. Probably. I'm going to take my mask off just so my computer will recognize my face. And then I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Gorgeous face. <laughs> I'm vaccinated and boosted, and I, uh, I took the uh, extra step of taking a COVID test two days ago, so I'm feeling good about being here and very honored to be with you. Um, I didn't realize what hallowed ground I was walking into, not only with so many heroes uh, that, that are here in this room right now, but also uh, the spirit of, of, of Jacob Lawrence in this space. I am just... I'm in awe of, uh, of this building and what it represents, and the people that I've met have been just wonderful. I've already learned things from you, so thank you. There was a woman, Marguerite, from Sweden, who shared with me the lesson uh, already that, um, she got it from Switzerland, right? Because she said uh, during the war, Switzerland was neutral and it was not enough to be neutral. And um, that's been something I've been really learning about when we talk about issues of equity and racism. And um, I think that's a lesson that I learned at the very start of my pediatric career, thanks to somebody in this room, Dr. Ed Bergman, who, yes, who not only is my first and longest mentor, um, but also is responsible for the Odessa Brown Clinic. Uh, he did much to make sure that it came into being. And so, uh, in so many ways, I own the gifts of the profession that I have reaped uh, very much to, to that man right there. And so, I'm very, very honored to be here and be with you. It is not enough to just be neutral. I'm going to continue to think and, and speak about that. So, I want to thank you for teaching me that. When I was thinking about what to present and what to talk about, um, I was at first going to put something very different together for you. And then as I was thinking about it, you know, I thought, I want to speak to you just as I would speak to medical students, or residents, or colleagues, or community folks that I talk to uh, around issues of equity. I want your permission, if it's okay, to speak about things like racism, and to share some of the things that uh, I learn along the way. None of this information or knowledge is mine, it's just things I learn along the way. I am also going to um, um, bring a lot of images, art, with me into this talk. I found in these last two years, maybe especially, that I crave art, I cherish art. I realize that for all the years and times when I've been talking and using bars and charts and graphs and numbers. I should have been using images and art and people. And so rather than, well, it might be one or two bars or charts. But mostly, what you'll see are murals, art murals from cities around this country that seem to somehow say something about whatever point I might make. So if I'm bored, if I'm not speaking loud enough, if I just am not saying anything you want to hear, I hope at least you'll see some beautiful art. <laughs> so here we go. You can see how much I like Jacob Lawrence. That was not uh, planted. This is the first slide that is on every single talk I give. The idea of, of building together, of constructing something, of creating something, partly with your hands and partly with your heart, is really meaningful to me. And Jacob Lawrence's 
journey and story is especially meaningful to me. And this, a copy of this one is is right out, what, 20 feet away from where I stand right now, which is really special. So I'm talking about inequities in healthcare, but also in health and in systems, and how those things all kind of loop and combine together. I'm going to talk about that sort of in the context of of these times that we're in. Um, that's a lovely picture, isn't it, on the side of a wall of a healthcare worker. And what I find sometimes is, even though it feels important to talk about issues of equity, I'm working with communities, with professionals, with folks who are really weary, who have spent two years at least working extremely hard. And I find that it can be so tiring that it feels like sometimes you don't have the energy to access the kind of passion that you need to address issues of inequity, to address issues of racism, to sort of reach for those kinds of moral and ethical kind of uh, layers of our work and our existence. So I want to acknowledge how much weariness there is in our world right now, how tired so many people are. And I also want to ask permission to keep asking for more because, as Marguerite told me, doing nothing is not enough. Being neutral is not enough. The meaning that we bring to our lives, the reasons that we love each other, the reasons that we try to be of service to our communities is because we care about more than just being neutral. We care about being passionate in our work and in our activities. So even though so many of us are so weary and so tired, I think it's that's the time when we really need to ask ourselves what we care about, what we value, what's important, and see through that weariness and continue to understand and talk and think and be challenged and question and maybe push back and maybe laugh and do all the things that make us wonderful human beings, right? So on with more art. But in these next few, I'll just be kind of laying the groundwork. The way I would talk to medical students about, let's be clear about these issues of inequity. They are not ideas that are pulled out of the air or perspectives or things that are on some level sort of subjective. They are very much in the objective experience of people, human beings, especially human beings with black and brown skin especially low-income human beings, our fellow human beings around us. So what they know, when I go into communities and talk with moms and grandmothers and aunties and uncles and, and other young people, they know these truths as their life experiences, and I see them in things like research. I see them in the research that shows that if you're a black mother in the U.S., you're more likely to die, three or four times more likely to die in childbirth than if you're a white mother in the US, that interacting with the healthcare system at a time that should be beautiful and creative and the beginnings of an amazing life are actually life-threatening to black women in this country. And I know that that signals that our healthcare system does not treat everybody well, does not treat everybody equitably or fairly. I know that it is not just mothers who risk their lives going into hospitals. Imagine if you will, a child, uh, a black child who has appendicitis, who has a kind of pain that is uh, unique to appendicitis that can only be treated with the right pain medicine and the right treatment and the right surgery. And the truth in this country is no matter where you are, what state you're in, what ER you go to, if you're a child whose skin is brown or black, the chance of walking into an emergency room in pain and getting adequate pain medication is 80% less than the same child who is white walking into the same ER with the same abdominal complaint. The only difference really being the color of their skin. This is not a unique issue in some, I don't know, southern ER somewhere. This is not a place that is happening over there. Unfortunately, this is the, the state of healthcare. This is the experience that happens in the areas that we love, the places that we appreciate, the places where people have the best of intentions. And it is the nature of systemic 
inequities, systemic racism, that says the color of your skin determines whether or not your pain will be treated, a child's pain would be treated in an emergency room. Let's carry that a little bit further. That child has appendicitis. In order to help make that diagnosis, you need, you need an imaging study, you need an ultrasound or a CT scan or an MRI. And again, if you look at what the research says across the country, another beautiful image though, right? Is that uh, for that same child, in those same ERs, six million children in this study, 44 different children's hospitals around this country, 44 of them, if they go into that ER in pain and they need an imaging study to find out what the diagnosis is, to find that appendicitis, the chance of it being diagnosed is significantly less because the chance of getting an imaging study is significantly less for that child with appendicitis. Most of the time, a child with appendicitis was kind of pretty healthy before the appendicitis, needs the surgery, and then can return to their health. If we continue to follow this child with appendicitis into the hospital, we still see the ways in which inequities show up. In this study, I told you I'm treating you just like medical students or residents, so uh, they want to hear this. where are the facts that back things up, where's the data to show things. So in this study, for that same child who goes through and has appendicitis surgery, the chance, and this is a study of 172,000 different children who went through surgeries, and they found that compared to white children, black children, odds of dying within 30 days after surgery was 3.43 times higher. The experience of healthcare, the kinds of experiences that should be the things that get you adequate pain medicine, get you the right studies and imaging, get you the right treatment and get you home safely. These experiences are different based on the color of your skin in this country. These are the things that we know from experiences that we've seen with people that we've known, the stories that, we've told, that have been told to us from families, from communities all around us. And it's important to also say that the data, the research, also backs that same experience up. And it's more than just being a child with appendicitis. It's more than a mom who's pregnant and delivering. It's for just about every healthcare experience that you could imagine in healthcare. And it's not about things actually really getting better in terms of those disparities. We'll do sometimes studies over and over again over the course of decades to see if trends are changing. And still, still, if you look at things like cancer, Black women with breast cancer continue to die more often, twice as likely to die of breast cancer than white women. The story behind that being delays in diagnosis, not getting the same imaging study, the same treatment. Uh, treatments that are um, happening when, when advanced cancer is in their bodies, that across the spectrum of care, racism, not race, but racism, is affecting the outcome for too many families. All of the things I've showed you so far are ways in which if you're black or brown in this country, you're more likely to get less care. And I will share with you that there is one scenario when you are more likely to get more care if you're black, Hispanic, Asian, or Pacific, and Pacific Islander in this country. And that's when the care is going to be less helpful for families with loved ones with advanced cancer and advanced age, where the quality of life is really important, the chance of getting unnecessary treatment is higher if your skin has more pigment in it. The only time when too much care happens. All of this is in the background of experiences that have been happening through the ages, through generations in this country. What we've done in the last two years is and another factor, haven't we? We sort of layered that up with uh, this pandemic. And it's tempting sometimes to think that what's happening in these last couple of years is unique to these last couple of years, is a feature of the pandemic alone. And what we need to remember is that that's a pandemic on top of all of the background of, of health outcomes that I showed you in those previous, uh, well, beautiful pieces of art but sad truths of data. 
when the British Medical Journal decided to sort of take a look one year into the COVID pandemic and say, what is this doing to life expectancy in this country? They found some pretty remarkable uh, results. I don't know if any of you had the chance to see that, but um, life expectancy has gone down. Mm -hmm. I think about uh, Magritte again, because the only other time when life expectancy in this country has gone down by this much was in World War II. So not since World War II has life expectancy changed so much. And it's changed for every ethnicity and racial category, but not equally among those different categories. The British Medical Journal looked at data in that first year, that year 2020, um, in life expectancy and saw that uh, white Americans lost 1.36 years of life expectancy. Black Americans, 3.25 and Hispanic Americans on nearly four years. Now, Dr. Bergman would know that a, a change in life expectancy of a few weeks in a year is actually a remarkable thing. That's a whole population changing in the life expectancy. So to see these numbers of, of years being changed is an enormous impact on a whole population of people, a whole layer of, of connectedness between generations changed significantly because of the layers of racism on top of this pandemic. Am I speaking loudly enough so far? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this Perfect. sort of what you're expecting to hear, or is this? <laughs> <laughs> you're doing great. Leave it out. Continue more so. It's hard in medicine because sometimes we just look at these numbers, and we also put such tight brackets around what we're looking at. And what's important to think about with this pandemic is not only has it changed life expectancy within a year. It's going to continue to have re reverberating effects across communities because people have had less time with their doctors. They've had less uh, cancer screens. They've had less blood pressure checks. They've had less care in general. And that has an impact also that will not be equally felt across all communities. That if you're low income or if you're non-white in this country, the amount of screening that you've had, the amount of preventive care, the kind of stuff that Dr. Bergman trained me to do as a primary care doctor, the opportunity for that care has changed. So if we're really gonna measure the impact of COVID across different populations, we'd have to keep watching, shouldn't we? For those missed cancers, and for the things that sometimes take 10 and 15 and 20 years to start to show up. Now in all of this though, it's tempting to start to Mm, I don't know how to say this any more kindly, so I'm just going to say it plainly. It's tempting sometimes to start to blame victims, it, to blame people. Well, perhaps that low-income family is not taking advantage of the care that they should be getting. Perhaps that black or that brown family is not practicing the adequate safety and health measures that they should be in order to stay well. That's maybe why there's that 3.25 or four year loss of life expectancy. Well, in this study that was just released, what, like a week ago, um, a key result was that families most affected by inequity during the pandemic were actually more likely to abide by safe practices like social distancing and hand washing, despite the popular narrative that minority groups are less likely to engage in such behaviors. It's just really important for us not to get drawn into the pathway of what did they do wrong that made them die more often? We have to understand that this is about systems affecting people, not uh, people who have made somehow what we would call bad choices. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. It's yes. just an important point to remember. I also love that uh, in their interview with the one of the authors of this study, she said that community level, transgenerational interventional strategies, which is saying a whole lot, but you know, connecting grandparents to grandkids, are necessary to combat the impact of the pandemic on these families. Universal childcare, increased access to school meals, universal basic income to cover fundamental needs, continued unemployment assistance. Now it's ruined there better housing opportunities. 
could be effective in either preventing or combating actually uh, the negative outcomes of COVID-19. This recurring lesson to me is that the things that we should have been doing all along are the things that we should be doing now to treat what is a, a pandemic in its best possible way. I have to remember that for all of the times that I thought I was getting smarter because I was in medical school or because I was learning from specialists about specialty care, that I actually had to then go into the community and into the clinic that Dr. Bergman helped create and then learn how to be an actual care provider. I don't know if any of you in your professional lives found that, that you did all that training, spent maybe a lot of years like I did paying off student loans, and then found out that the real lessons that you needed to learn were the ones that you learned by being with other people, not by being in a computer lab. And it's interesting to me because it also taught me that, that health is experienced not just you know interactions, of course, with healthcare, but are so influenced by, by the lives around us and by the opportunities that we have. So you can't talk about health or even health inequities without understanding the rest of the environment of inequity that we exist in in this country. And again, it's tempting sometimes to say everything is just steadily getting better. That we've had bigger problems before. And one of my other mentors, um, when I first came to Seattle, was um, a Dr. Alvin Thompson. Is that his name, Dr. Bergman? Yes. Alvin Thompson. This amazingly distinguished, incredibly wise, a wonderful black doctor. In many ways, sort of the first black doctor that I got to know as a medical student. And he talked about his experiences as a young doctor here in Seattle and his journey. He talked about just across the street, he worked a lot at Virginia Mason, uh, but he could not, when he was first practicing, walk through the front door of Virginia Mason. He had to go through the, the basement entrance, and so did his patients. And that's powerful, right? It's amazing. But it's also tempting to think that because I can walk through the front door of Virginia Mason, that that must mean that, that people's lives are necessarily absolutely better than during that time. And it's not as true as I wish it were. I look at other aspects of life, not just the health data I see. I look at what opportunities people have to be healthy, to be well, and a lot of that has to do with what resources, material resources you have in your life. I look at how family wealth has changed over years. This might track the course of my career in medicine, but these lines actually continue to go back in time. And what's striking is that the family wealth for white families in this country has gone, well, it's gone up um, mostly steadily. Most of the time has gone up. The family wealth for black families in this country has stayed at almost rock bottom almost all the way through. So in a way, that disparity is greater, isn't it? But it also means that um, $6,000 in family wealth and the whole resource that a whole family has, that is not adequate to, to own a home. It's not adequate to pay for a college. It's not enough to pass wealth on to another generation and see generations upon generations uh, grow and get healthier. It's a flat line. And what that means is that opportunities for health and wellness and joy are, are deeply impacted by the lack of resource that we distribute and that we have based on the color of our skin in this country. I am a rare, rare being. Dr. Thompson was a groundbreaker in being a black physician. There actually are not that many black male physicians in this country still today. When you talk about things like, I don't know, bars and charts and these measures and these numbers I keep throwing at you, um, it becomes tempting to think that we can measure everything and understand it. Um, and I find that it's important to think about what really happens with racism and how that affects lives. 
and how we could really think that we could understand it with a simple set of numbers or bars or charts. I think about what happens with cultural erasure, what happens when someone is denied their identity, and their connection to many, many generations of knowledge, their connection to language, their connection to the cultures and practices that make them whole. I don't think that this kind of erasure can be measured on any, any bar chart that I can think of. I wonder about what happens for generations afterwards when we've gone through a time of erasing cultures through oppression and through racism in this country. And I wonder how we should be thinking differently about the magnitude of, of those impacts and those changes. It would be tempting. I don't know why I keep saying that sentence, but I'm going to start with that one one more time. <laughs> it would be tempting sometimes to think that the different outcomes in our healthcare system are just part of bigger systems in the whole country, right? That healthcare is just this, this widget, this cog, this part of a bigger set of systems, and in a way, healthcare itself isn't intentionally harmful. It's just part of a society that treats people un inequitably, unequally. But I think it is important sometimes to pay attention to our history and, and, and see what lessons it has for us. And our history has many stories, especially in healthcare. One of them is that um, in the 1850s, healthcare people decided that they needed to justify enslavement. And so they created diseases, they made up diseases, they used the same kind of pretend Latin and Greek that, that uh, some of you in this room as physicians had to learn very well, but they used it to make up diseases. They decided that the idea that uh, running away from enslavement meant there was something wrong with you, and they made up the disease streptomania. And they decided that not wanting to work under a whip and chain meant there was something wrong with you, so they made up a disease called diesthesia ethiopica. <laughs> And it might be that that's something that happened in the past and, and is to be forgotten, but I'm going to just look at these other um, sections here to see if you see how themes kind of carry through over time. In the 1970s, psychiatrists added the word aggressive into their diagnosis of schizophrenia, adding a name or adding a word, making up a component of a diagnosis, or at least enhancing a part of it, and then specifically uh, applying that that name, that added, that made up, added component to uh, black patients as a way to label the behavior of blackness as aggressive, as out of control, as inappropriate, and then start treatments that were basically specifically oriented towards them. And if we carry that even further into time, African Americans even today with mood disorders, depression, the kinds of things for which antidepressants would be most effective, are actually more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, aggressive, seeing as their behavior is inappropriate and uh, treated in that way. You can see the threads, right? It's not just a benign healthcare system, but it's a, it's a system that's making decisions. I feel embarrassed saying these things because I'm so honored to be a doctor I, I love being a pediatrician. I, I love the opportunity to work with these amazing kids and families. But we don't get to be just one thing, purely good, right? We have complex identities and we're part of complex systems. And unless we're willing to see all of ourselves in the mirror, we're going to cut ourselves shaving pretty often. Medicine would cut itself shaving pretty often because it's really hard for medicine to actually look at itself and really understand what's happening. Here's an example from last spring, almost a year ago now, I guess. The experiences of a physician who was doing research on racism in healthcare and would submit articles to the medical journals for publication. And every time they submitted an article to the journal, the title he would submit would say racism in liver cancer care or something like that they would edit the title and take out the word racism 
and used some other word that felt softer, like intolerance. Mm. And the more he complained about it, the more he was counseled by his mentors that if you speak up too much, you will be seen as an angry black man. And colleagues would start to distance themselves from you. It's hard for us to come to terms with issues and then address issues if we're unable to talk about issues, honestly. If we're unable to use the words that you're allowing me to use today, like, like racism. It's hard for us to understand those unless, unless we can be really clear, like Lord, Jacob Lawrence was in his descriptions and his imagery and the stories that his, his pictures told that were very clear in their language. Language is really important in healthcare. It's extremely important because in essence, as physicians, a lot of the time what we are is storytellers and chroniclers of other people's lives. We write down things in charts, or at least these days we type into electronic health records. And what we say can become perpetually associated with a person, can be perpetually tied to a person um, and everyone after us, whether we know that next doctor or not, will read our words and will form an opinion about that person. And it turns out, in a study from January, I don't know why this isn't advancing, I'm sorry. Frozen? Because I'm talking too much. <laughs> study from January of this year was looking at electronic health records. I'm looking at when doctors use disparaging language in charts and found is much more likely to have disparaging language like uncooperative or non-compliant. Um, to be sort of disbelieved, language that tells somebody else that I don't believe that what this patient is telling me. But that happens more often, two and a half times more often, if uh, a patient is black compared to white. And it's not just that. Um, being African American or Hispanic Latino or uh, API, especially Pacific Islander, families understand that when they come to healthcare, they come under a certain kind of scrutiny. The kinds of things that can show up in their church are just the things that can make them feel less than comfortable all the time. I will share this um, and could answer questions about it later. One of the tipping points for me that really forced me to have to resign from Seattle Children's was that um, they knew about how they were <laughs> disparately treating black and brown families, that they were policing black and brown families differently in the hospital. They were more likely to call security on a, on a black or brown family. They knew that for years and years and years and um, held on to that information and didn't do anything differently. And it was right around the time when people were starting to make really powerful statements about racism, the summer of 2020, right? And I saw some incredibly powerful statement about how horrible racism is by the leadership at Seattle Children's Hospital. And I knew that in the same moment, they were holding on to data that said that, that they policed black and brown families differently. And the hospital then had no, no statement of doing anything about that. Just some flowery words about how wrong racism was. I, I, I was raised to be a tough person and to put up with a lot. Um, and I, uh, I think maybe made excuses about it's one thing just not to know when you're doing harm. It's one thing to just not realize when that's happening. It's another altogether to know that you're doing harm and not do anything about it. It was a tipping point for me and it, it just, it wasn't like my experience is any different or new or unique. They've done studies, they've done studies of, of nurses who are the consummate observers of things happening around them in hospitals, right? The best, the most informed about what's happening are nurses. And they did a survey of a thousand uh, nurses and found that almost two-thirds of the time, nurses observed racial discrimination or disadvantage affecting someone else other than themselves in the past year. Those experiences they're not unique to any one group of people. We see them happening 
all the time. And we all, in some ways, are complicit to that. We are all sometimes a little bit of Switzerland in our responses to that, and that's important. It's important that we not allow ourselves, even when we're weary, even when we're tired, even when we've been through a lot, that we cannot continue to be complicit in that. It's hard in healthcare because healthcare, this is the closest image I could find, healthcare <laughs> is a frenetic and an increasingly frenetically paced kind of profession, trying to make sure that you really don't always have time to check your conscience and understand if what you're doing is right or wrong, and especially when it's about relationships, definitely not enough time to spend actually building the relationship that you need to, to understand somebody who doesn't look like you, or to understand someone whose language is different than you, to understand somebody whose life experiences are different. We structured healthcare, uh, maybe on purpose, to make sure that, that we don't have time to actually know and understand each other. And it makes us make assumptions. It's a challenge, um, and it affects us in different ways. We often think that there are different kinds of hospitals that are doing different kind of work. Um, I've become really curious about this idea of what it means to be a nonprofit hospital in this country. And just as one example, you would think that a nonprofit hospital that gets to pay less in taxes should be putting that saved money back into the communities from which it would have been paying taxes to support. I've seen a few studies now that show this same thing that Nonprofit hospitals don't actually put uh, any more towards uncompensated care than for-profit hospitals do. The amount of money that's saved in taxes does not go back <coughs> to the communities that they owe that tax money to. Our structure needs to be different. It needs to be the kind of space where you can take the time to understand and know each other, where you look into the eyes of another human being and you see promise and beauty and power, and something that just takes your breath away a little bit, that makes you want to pause and say, you are the most incredible thing in the world. And I'm so thankful that I had a chance to be in space with you. Healthcare needs to be different. It needs to sometimes embrace complexity and understand that when you see a person and you see the five minutes or 10 minutes that you've seen with them, you're, you're actually supposed to try at least to understand that there's an amazing number of different things happening in their lives. They're made up of so many different, I don't know, call them intersections, that, that they're not just one category, one label, they're not just one thing from one space, but they're beautifully complex, beautifully arrayed like all of you, and that that's not possible to just label that with one sentence, one line, or one word. Healthcare needs to be different, and I see, I was just telling Dr. Counts what I see in the medical students that I get to work with today, and how so many of them are just not putting up with the stuff that I think I put up with just to get by and just to move ahead in my career. They're not tolerating the kinds of approaches that are rife with, with discrimination anymore. And it's really inspiring to me. I really learn a lot from them. But we're actually not bringing enough of those different thinking professionals into the profession. A couple of studies here basically say what, what you should be aware of is that we're not actually keeping up with the diversity of our country. That it would take probably a century to actually catch up with the amount of diversity that's in our country if we wanted to make our healthcare field as diverse as the people that they're serving. All of that rich knowledge, all of those different ideas, all that different ways of thinking, seeing somebody complexly taking time to know them, we're not actually giving ourselves the gift these many different ways of thinking that would make our healthcare field so much better. All of our fields probably better, but I know healthcare, so that's what I'm talking about. And also, it's still hard to come as your whole self into healthcare. It's hard to show up as your full, bold, powerful, unapologetic, this is where I came from self. And when you're not allowed to be your whole self, what you hold back would have been a gift for so many other people around you. Healthcare still asks you to live, wear a, a bit of a mask and indoctrinate yourself, and we have to change that. Sometimes we put words and lip service to it. We create jobs and positions in institutions to have offices of equity or diversity or some combination of a D and an E and an I and a title. But the healthcare system isn't quite serious about it yet. <laughs> right? <laughs> 
you know that the hospital is not serious about it when they rescind their offer to hire you for your work on equity because you are too conscious of issues of inequity. That's a trap, actually, that a lot of a lot of diverse healthcare uh, providers get fallen into because you get pulled into: Will you be part of this DII committee? And will you be this equity officer for the hospital? But uh, we're not actually going to invest you with the power, or we're going to be a little bit afraid if you speak up too much. So I really want um, healthcare folks, because this is the kind of talk I give to healthcare folks. I want them to start asking them more reflective questions more questions about, about how they show up in the systems that they inhabit. The questions that might be like this or might be different. How do we make sure that we're going in the right direction in this work? How do we make sure that we're actually narrowing gaps rather than widening them? What is my own personal commitment to equity, to making sure that others are lifted up, that we are changing and writing some of the runs? What, what am I willing to risk and to give up in order to see that happen? How do we avoid creating performance art out of equity titles without making changes? How do I assure that I don't get pitted just against someone else in order to keep the status quo the way it is? How can I assure that they won't just wait for an issue to go away and go back to business as usual? This is the last time I'll say something about Seattle Children's because um, the people there are people I love the hospital is a hospital I love, and that's the reason, in so many ways, that I'm critical. Um, if I didn't care, I wouldn't care, right? It's a year now um, since I stepped down, since uh, a big fancy investigation with Eric Holder, like Attorney General Eric Holder, was completed, millions of dollars spent. That full report was completely squashed and, and held under wraps. Uh, some more fancy words have come out from that hospital, um, but the true accountability has not happened. Uh, they know that they can wait. They can wait until we become more like Switzerland. Not, there's many great things about Switzerland. It needs to stop. I need to apologize to Margaret <laughs> for saying these things, but um, we, they're waiting for us to be neutral, to, to stop caring as much anymore. How do we change that? And I also want to challenge my own communities to step up in a different way, to maybe start to question the stories that we've been told or told ourselves. I was raised in a, in a black community in Washington, D.C. Uh, my mother's white, and so she kind of just moved to the, the inner city D.C. so that I would have an experience of being around other, other black people. And I, I really appreciate her for that because I think she made enormous sacrifices just for that. It's amazing. And I learned so many important lessons from uh, street moms and uncles and things that were around me. Lessons that sometimes were really great and sometimes were authority uh, about being twice as good, making sure whether you're on the basketball court or in the, in the anatomy lab or uh, on, the, on the wards that you were twice as good because you had to be twice as good in order to get as far as you wanted to how to try to dress better and speak better, how to perform the things that medical students today aren't quite willing to do as much. And I start to question some of the things that, that I just thought were like really wonderful and laudable things. I remember as a child this, this thing that um, some of my aunties would say to me, which I think is a little, sort of a Martin Luther King Jr. kind of statement about if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. If, but do whatever you need to to keep moving forward. I thought that was so powerful about just keep trying, keep moving forward. I look at that today, and it looks a lot like we're expecting uh, people who have already been oppressed to just drag their bodies along in a system that won't change. And I wonder when we start asking the systems to change rather than asking people to crawl. I bought into that. This is a, as far as I know, I don't speak for all black people, but this is a black community's tale and story of survival. We have to stop telling ourselves in black communities and brown communities these kinds of stories too, because all they do is they contribute to making exceptionalism. The one or two people um, get through and they make it so everyone has to be twice as good just to get half as far. They make it 
so that the burden is on, on, you, on the black person, the brown person, the low income person to struggle rather than changing the system so that everybody has a great opportunity. I've been thinking about this a lot because it makes me realize all the things that go together to sort of hold people down. This feels like really, really hard work. And you could call me lazy, but I think the work of liberation is actually easier work than the work of oppression. I try to make this point with medical students right now because, like I said, they're really weary. They're really tired after two years straight of a pandemic. So I want to tell them, maybe it's less work to lift up equity, to work on liberation. Oppression, holding people down all the time, it's not like gravity. It's not, gravity is probably easier to hold down than to lift up. I think oppression works the other way around. I think it's way more work to hold people down than it is to lift them up. It's an idea I'm toying with, and so I'm experimenting on saying that to you all. I wonder if that's something that you agree with or identify with. I think oppression is hard work. And I'm surprised how much work we put into that. I wonder how we do things differently. What it would it look like to just see each other fully, to take that extra time to just really see each other? What would that experience be like if that was part of our expectation of our training? If we saw each other, not just as individuals, but part of these amazing communities. Okay, this is an underpass in Oakland. And I took, I think it's amazing that we took the space between the two lanes to create the shaft of light and then did the art. Anyway, it's just beautiful artwork. <laughs> but if we saw ourselves as part of communities, and in those communities we saw incredible gifts and talents and beauty and amazing things to share and learn about and gain and grow from each other. If we saw the beauty around us instead of, well, I guess all that negative stuff I was talking about before. I wondered how our healthcare system would be different if we looked at beauty and skill and talent and difference as a gift for us to learn from. If we looked at learning even differently, got a little bit away from those statistical models and really thought about what, what wisdom looks like around us, what true wisdom really is and how, how we should be reaping that, learning from that, growing from that, rather than running from that and running towards p-values and statistical significance. I wonder what it could look like to have a different kind of health care system. I've seen little inklings of it. I went to the Mount Vernon area, to the Swinomish tribe. They started a clinic, this is just one example, for substance use disorder treatment. And rather than just a place where you get sort of medical treatment for substance use disorder. They created a whole system in this clinic. It's an amazing place. They have daycare if you are struggling with substance use and you have children. They have a transportation system so that um, if you live far away, you can get picked up. They have really early hours so that you can keep your job and not have to tell people, I need to take time off from work to go to my substance use treatment. They have uh, social workers, mental health people, and nurses and treatment all in one space. And it's so holistic and beautiful, and it's really powerful. It has changed the dynamic in the Swinomish tribe. But not only that. Today, if you went to that substance use disorder clinic on the Swinomish tribal lands, you would find that 80% of the people who use that clinic are non-tribal. Yeah. That the communities around them are benefiting so much from a model of care that is more holistic, more embracing, more comprehensive, more thoughtful, more well-designed, more beautiful, more understanding of the complexity of life. Everyone benefits. It's this um, idea that gets bandied around called uh, targeted universalism. That if you do something for those with the greatest barriers, you actually do something that benefits everyone, even those without barriers. The curb cut out on the corner, right? Yeah. done for the person who needs the help with the wheelchair, but also beneficial to the mom with the stroller or the dad with the stroller. Or to me, that would have jaywalked otherwise, but just saw that curb cut and said, maybe I'll cross at the corner instead. Targeted universalism, the approach that says that those who've had the most disadvantage actually have the best ideas for making things better for everybody. There are models of care out there that are different and beautiful. There's a, there's a clinic that's getting started right now it's called the Tubman Center for Health and Liberation. As I think, I think, a, I think it's today's version of the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. It's not just talking about, about getting care and suffering through a system that doesn't treat you well. It's about um, 
maybe the black community owning the clinic itself and staffing it itself and having researchers who do research from that community itself and has uh, not only healthcare but mentoring for young people so that they will be the leaders that will be in that community and make that community incredibly powerful in the next generation. That thinks about housing and freedom and liberation as much as it thinks about, I don't know, blood pressures and erythrocyte counts and those other things. There are other ways to do healthcare, and I think they're beautiful and powerful. And I think one of the common themes that they have is that they see communities that others have seen with deficits and seeing them with abundance, has seen them as places of brilliance, where incredible ideas come from, where new ways of thinking come from, where, where talent just bubbles over and abounds. And it really made me wonder, I don't know, I'm on a lot of boards, I do a lot of organizing, I have a lot of uh, different kinds of jobs where I talk about uh, how to create programs and things like that at the state level or the county or the city. And I really wonder if in every meeting I was in, we had to start the sentences that we were going to say with this, with this sentence, based on the brilliance that we know exists in that Pacific Islander community, we should be building a program that does this. Instead of based on the deficits that we know happen, instead of the negative labs and values and data that I was showing you before, if we started with, based on the brilliance that we know exists in South King County, we should be building programs that taps into that brilliance and allows it to shine. What if we build programs based on that? That would be the kind of response to the ages and ages of inequities that would make a true difference. And that would also make us remember something that is so easy to forget these days as we silo and separate ourselves. That we are all absolutely in this together. And not only that, but that we are all absolutely better together. And so that's the message I wanted to share. I could have just gone to this slide, but I had to torture you with lots of extra words. But at least you got to see some beautiful art in the meantime. I'm sorry for that. The art was good though, right? Uh, we have three microphones and I see question number one back here. One right here, who wants to speak? There. So, you want to cover that? Okay. Dr. Danielson, you referenced um, Eric Holder's looking into the situation at Children's Hospital, and I believe you said it's been buried. What can we do to get that unearthed? Because the City of Seattle really needs to know about that. I agree with you. I think uh, the city and the county and the region deserve to know about that. It's, uh, it's beyond the city, right? The, the added responsibility that a place like Seattle Children's has is that it, it, it responds to the care needs of six states legitimately, and the cultures and the experiences, the challenges of being in rural Washington and coming here for care. To me, that says that the responsibility is much higher for a place like Children's Hospital in Seattle. In Boston, there are two or three children's hospitals you could go to. If you were getting bad care at one, you could just go to another. Um, can't do that in Seattle. In fact, for five or six states, there really is one, one main choice that you have to make. And I, so I say that because I think the responsibility to be transparent, to be very, very clear about sharing where your flaws are, where you need to work, is, is of paramount importance. I think we should all be demanding that. Again, out of love, I do not want to sound like I'm a hater of, of Seattle Children's because I think it's an amazing place. I, I want it to be also an amazing place that treats people better. I think that we should be speaking out. We should be using the power of our electronic pens. We should be showing that there are numbers of us who care about transparency. And that um, through that, that that's a pathway to healing, perhaps. Um, that this is a wound that is un unhealable as long as our understanding of it, our knowledge of it, is kept from us. Um, I would ask you, what do you think we should do to get that information? 
simple. Microphone. Write letters. Write letters. I agree. Are you right to the president of the board, well. the chair of the board? Yeah. The board has a lot to say with yeah, what happened. It's the board. And then Over the, here? Oh, and the sorry. lawyers. They're listening Thank you. to the lawyers. Uh, I'm curious about the Swinomis example where they started out with these wonderful things and now 80% uh, of, the, of the clientele is non uh, Native American. I wonder if that's because they did such a good chance, a good job with the Native Americans so that those folks figured it out and didn't need it? Or did they get pushed aside by the majority of whites oh. and, and, and get in there? That's, that's a great question. Do you sometimes, have an opinion about that? Sometimes good ideas end up not being shared equally, right? Yeah. I, uh, so I'm, um, I'm friends with um, the tribal leader there, Brian Clattisby, an amazing person who, who um, was the president of that tribe, at least he stepped down. He is the one that got that clinic going. And, um, he was very intentional about setting a standard and a model that other people could appreciate and understand. What he would say, I'm confident, is that the, the depth of substance use disorder struggling in his tribe has diminished incredibly, thanks to programs like that. Because of their clinic? Because of their clinic and, and other, other things as well. This whole community sort of stepping up um, to really see each member as highly valued and making sure that people felt like they had a purpose and a future and opportunity. Um, but it was also, the design of that clinic was to be able to serve more than the tribe, to set a model. I think a little bit, if I know Brian, it was kind of a little bit of a shame on you model. Like, come here, take a look at this. Why aren't, why aren't you all doing this? The other thing that they did with their dental clinic was that they allowed something that Alaska has allowed forever, uh, the equivalent of sort of nurse practitioners, dental therapists, to practice there. And again, it extends the ability to provide needed dental care uh, to regions of the state that just don't have enough dentists and make that impossible to get good care. They're doing a lot of innovative things in the spaces and places that you might not realize across the state. Thank you. Oh, that's it. I appreciate your question though. Thank you, because that's really important. It's, it's hard to change systems. Systemic systems go and go and go. Uh, I was a chaplain at a hospital in the South End and we discovered we weren't treating our minorities adequately. And so we went out and hired someone to create 18 manuals on 18 different minority groups. Mm. And we were able to, to really speak to those communities. But we didn't change the systems. And, I, and as I look back, I see that as a real failure. I wonder what the, I wonder if we would def define changing systems probably differently, everyone in this room. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. If you're creating 18 different individualized approaches to the way you care about people, that's a lot different than standardizing care so that everyone has to fit into the same shoe. Um, that feels like a systemic change to me on some level. It might not be the scale that I think your bigger point is about, but uh, but boy, change change can happen. It can start at the smallest scale. It can spark and inspire other people to do other things differently. It can it can grow like a weed. It can spread like Omicron. And uh, uh, but it, it needs for that start to happen. And sometimes people don't want to do anything because the system's too big. The problem feels bigger. I don't have any power, I can't do anything. And, and what I tell medical students and doctors um, is that you have way more power than you know. And that the little thing that you do, and the thing that you keep doing, is the thing that's going to eventually make the big difference. That was nurse driven, not doctor driven. Drew, I believe that absolutely too. <laughs> yes. Over to, go ahead. Okay, short. Can you talk a little bit about the involvement of the Black Panther movement? Ooh in the central area and in with the country doctor and and other activities i think that was really remarkable how much they helped and 
and what an example they were to Panthers in other parts of the United States. Such a great point, and it's probably a mistake for me not to include that in here. <laughs> Seattle was the second Black Panther um, site to be started, and uh, we have some amazing brothers to thank for that who are still around us today. Um, again, the innovation, it reminds me of the Swanamish, right? Uh, you bring food to folks who are at home and can't get out of their door. You bring, you make sure kids have breakfast before they go to school, and oh my God, you learn better when you have a meal. You make sure that you care about housing and safety on the streets around you, and um, all of those are actually healthcare practices, in my opinion. I got to watch uh, one of the founders of Black Panther Party interact with, with kids. It was on Zoom, but they were doing this little art thing and talking, and I came around to the challenge of uh, education that's got all the similar disparities that we've talked about tonight in healthcare. And I was watching this Elmer Dixon, problem-solving school education for, for young immigrant black children in the system. And these kids were coming up with ideas, and they were sharing ideas with him. And he was like, that's great, but what we could also do is make sure of this. And um, right in that moment, I was just I was just amazed by the wisdom of young people and what, what incredible things happen when you bring generations together to talk about the problems that seem insurmountable. Over here. Oh, okay. Is, is, it, is, is this on? Yes. Um, I, I know um, I'm trying to make cross-cut word thing. I see something about one of these little blurbs talking about that, that, that actually minority enrollment in like the medical school has actually been going down on a percentage basis for about 20 years and you know one of the ideas well because the, the smart money is all going into the tech fields at least I know a couple people that that's an example of it um, what I'm hearing you really say is while it would be good to have more minorities working in the system that's just like a drop in the bucket of some of the changes or do you think having those people does really make a difference that we should help push for more opportunities for minorities to have those direct care roles absolutely yeah again if i were being a, a data nerd i would tell you that um actually health outcomes are better when patients look like their providers and oh, vice yeah. versa. Sure. And I, I mean, I know men as a group don't like to go to the doctor, but the right. black men that I've known, right. whoa. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's absolutely essential. I think you're also saying there are other things that need to happen. There's more about systems that need to change so that you can be a, a widely diverse workforce oh, and they can yeah. have the opportunity to be its, its full self um, because the systems oh, have been as well. Oh. Okay. I'm going to shorten up my answers so that I'm not taking up so much air time on these responses. Can I just ask you this? Um, there's a lot of discussion in policy circles about whether it's better to emphasize race-based, uh, uh, you know, uh, problem-solving or economic-based. So, and you mentioned a couple of times poor people along with the list of uh, black and brown people. And I just wonder what you think about that whole issue of basing things on, on, on wealth rather than anything else? Um, I think that um, it's important to understand where things overlap and intersect and where they're different. And just one example, just to be quick, is that um, you can be one of the richest black women in this country and your chance of dying in childbirth is still three times higher than if yeah. you're white. Oh, yeah. You know, if you are the world's greatest tennis player of all time, um, you still nearly die in childbirth. So that tells you that there's something beyond socioeconomics and that you would make a mistake if you only had socioeconomic solutions to problems that are really about racism. I will also say that one thing I've learned in my language is to really talk about racism instead of race. I don't know that that's always about how you should design programs, but uh, Tenehisi Coates, uh, a great author, kind of line that said something like, Race is the child of racism, not the father. That racism predates race in the way that we socially think about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we make the mistake then of thinking, actually then thinking that, that the race is what's driving this health outcome that's different. And it's not the race, it's not the color of the skin, it's not the pigment that is making you um, die. It's the racism that is happening. 
So I think we have to hold those ideas in mind. These are complicated solutions. So when you're not going to hear me say, you know, uh, one of my least favorite questions is what's the one, what's the one or two things we should we should all be doing right now? <laughs> These are big problems that have been 500 years long. One or two things will not do it. I guess that's the reason that maybe it's. I read it, an article today, the opinion about the possibility of the that racism is not has been going on since the 1700s. We still have it, and what the possibility of a civil just so they can hear of, of a civil war. The possibility of a civil war. Of a civil war. Yeah, this article said there are that's he wasn't in favor of it, but there are a lot of people now. And it, it is it just right. seems that that's maybe the only answer. No. No. Uh, no. I hope not, but um, I hope not. I also you know, I think about like we had a civil war stopped enslavement, but it didn't stop racism. We had a civil rights era, um, which tried to improve uh, issues around social justice, but didn't necessarily stop. I think, uh, I think the word civil is valuable. I wonder if we had a civil health movement with that kind of thing. Could you uh, give some examples of the racism at children's. One example was the um, the policing, the likelihood of having security called on you. And um, I'm not going to go away from that for a second because, um, well, he's going to be tired of me naming his name. But there's a certain doctor who was a mentor of mine who taught me about the importance of dignity in care. Uh, and that doesn't show up sometimes in these studies of emergency room outcomes or chance of dying after surgery and things like that. Dignity. Um, when the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic started, there was a term called quality care with dignity that its first medical director, an incredible black woman, uh, coined. Um, the value of dignity is just something we should be talking more about. Is there dignity happening in this care? Is this a dignified and dignifying experience? Uh, I think that is such at the root of things. And, to walk into a hospital and know that security is watching you more closely. And if you don't cry enough, then you're thought of as cold, and maybe you need a social worker and CPS referral. If you cry too much, maybe you're aggressive, like those uh, psychiatric things I showed you, and perhaps you need security called on you. That idea of being watched. I heard a story from an indigenous mentor of mine, um, Abigail Echo Hawk incredible researcher and an amazing woman that you should invite here to talk because you would like amazing. She said, I would come back and then just be part of the audience because she's incredible. She was talking about an experience with uh, Native mothers who were coming into Swedish hospital to get care and were silent, not saying anything, and it was creating great concern. And the, the doctors and nurses were just like, this mom is not plugged into her child. She is not ready to be a mother. We need to call social work. We need to get some home-based services going. We need to really police whether or not she's a good mother or not. Um, and then the clinic that Abigail works with uh, to send one of its native indigenous physicians over to visit her. And she opened up. And she was just like, oh my god, I feel safe. I can talk to you. I'm not going to have everything I say judged. She was just this ebullient, like expressive. Just, I'm so excited to be a mom. It's just such a wonderful experience. There's so much in that little story that goes beyond some of the, tell me what the measures of racism are in our healthcare system and speak to something that is much more, yeah, silencing. And, and anyway, there's that. Um, Children you know, also knows that they did not provide adequate translation services for their patients. And again, I'm talking about families who travel Many hundreds of miles come to a place and, and can't understand or speak or don't get the adequate translation services. The staff at, at um, the hospital that are staff of color all have their own stories to tell. They're much more harrowing than mine, but they don't, they don't quit and they don't leave because they don't have the privilege that I do. 
And I totally acknowledge that I've had the privilege to make a choice that other people who have to pay a mortgage through one particular job line can't make those kinds of choices. The stories go on, the, the, the data and the places go on. Some of them are things that are shared by many hospitals. Some of them, I believe, are kind of unique to Seattle Children's uh, corporate kind of environment now, which is really different than it was even when I first started. Is there one last imperative question, or can we let Dr. Danielson <laughs> end his long day? I think we are concluding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and we hope Dr. and be with us again soon. And bring his friend.